True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the True Crime Fix podcast with Stevie B. When you start a podcast and you're in the planning stage, you lay out an episode plan of cases that you want to cover. You then decide what you want the episodes to cover and the date the episode is going to be released. You vow to yourself that you're going to stick rigidly to that plan so that you know what you're doing and any cases that you discover, you can just tag on at the end. Then you go and watch a fantastic documentary, which almost brings you to tears because of the content and the story and all of the best laid plans, as they say, go completely out the window. I have a particular reason for bumping this episode up the list this week, though. And that is because it is National Stalking Awareness Week in the UK this week. I have personal experience of seeing what the aftermath of bad relationships can do to people in the job that I do. And I only get to see these people when they are actually free of the torment. Touch wood, I will never have to experience or know anybody who will have to go through the terror that the unwanted attention of being stalked brings. I have already touched on one stalking case in episode 1, Zofia Zavodska, but after hearing about this case, I knew I had to cover it. In the United Kingdom, two women a week are murdered by their partners or ex-partners, and stalking is deemed as the reason for 94% of these cases. I think this case also hits home a little for me, for two other reasons. Firstly, I like to think that I'm a reasonably nice guy who cannot comprehend why somebody may actually act like this. But secondly, I have a younger sister who I am super protective of. And the idea that anybody would think like this actually makes my stomach turn. National Stalking Awareness Week this year runs from Monday the 8th of April to Friday the 12th of April. It is promoted by the Susie Lamplew Trust, a charity organisation set up to raise awareness to all aspects of personal safety. For those people who do not know the case of Susie Lamplew, I'll give you a brief outline of this case. Susie was an estate agent based in Fulham, West London. She was reported missing on the 28th of April 1986 after doing a viewing at Sherrod's Road with Mr Kipper. She had previously mentioned to her mother that she was receiving some unwanted attention but she went missing before being able to divulge any more. If you want to hear more about this case, Case 48 of Case File does an amazing job of covering it so I'll leave it to the anonymous host to give you the full details. But please listen to this story first, as there's a strong message, particularly for young people, in this episode. This year, the focus of National Stalking Awareness Week is to shine a light on stalking as a public health issue. Stalking can have a devastating impact on the victim's emotional and mental well-being, as well as their physical safety. This case I am going to highlight today is an example of how a manipulative person will do all they can to control their victim. But it's also a story about how social media posts in the wrong hands plot out your every move. We live our lives on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Snapchat nowadays, but 
This demonstrates why we should be checking our privacy settings and making sure that everyone is aware that information can get into the wrong hands. This story also highlights how, because of the ambiguity of the Protection from Harassment Act 1997 with relation to stalking, errors were made by the police which could have made the situation a lot worse. Please, if you are or have been the victim of stalking, please call the National Stalking Helpline on 0808 802 0300 if you're in the UK or if you're in the US 1 866 689 4357 for Safe Horizons. Please get assistance. Please get help to stop these individuals. I would hate for any of my listeners to be the feature in their own true crime documentary or podcast. Now you may think that I'm saying that as a joke, but I'm being deadly serious. I would hate the thought that anybody listening to this episode would end up being a victim of a stalker. Without any further introduction... This is your True Crime Fix. I'm your host Steve and this case is written in memory of Molly McLaren and the horrendous ordeal that she went through in the last year of her life. Molly McLaren was born on the 26th of May 1994 in Cobham, Kent, to mother Joanne McLaren and father Doug McLaren. She also had a brother called Tom. Molly was liked by everyone growing up and she was described as having an outgoing and lively personality. Her magnetic personality meant that she was able to make friends very easily. Although her outward personality was very positive, she was internally battling with her own demons. Molly suffered with bulimia for long periods of her adult life. However, Molly showed incredible strength to not let the disorder affect her life. For those who are not exactly sure what bulimia is, it's an emotional disorder which often subconsciously gives the person a distorted body image. It's an obsessive desire to lose weight. The person may go through bouts of extreme overeating, which are then followed by fasting or self-induced vomiting, known as purging. The exact cause of bulimia is currently unknown. It is thought that multiple factors contribute to the development of the eating disorder, including genetic, environmental, psychological and cultural influences. So how does she overcome her demons? In Molly's case, she chose to exercise and her study of nutrition proved to be the means by which she confronted her challenges. There is a selfie video which Molly made as she jogged through the lovely Kent countryside. Get to the same bit every day. I feel like I'm lagging. Everyone gets that bit. Just got pushed through. It is not pretty. To quote her parents whilst they were reflecting on their daughter's outlook on life, ultimately, we are not defined by the challenges that life throws at us. We are defined by how we face them. Molly confronted her demons head on. She tried to understand them and worked on a strategy that finally allowed her to be a winner. Inner strength and self-belief are key to winning any battles. You must first believe in yourself, after that anything is possible. Molly became a fitness fanatic and ultimately would post motivational content on her Facebook, Instagram and Twitter as a blogger. She lived her life through these platforms and seemed to be having fun. 
It's also worth mentioning that Molly was an absolutely massive fan of Arsenal Football Club. She worked part-time at Ted Baker in Dartford, where she met her best friend, Amy Lee. Amy echoed the feelings that Molly was a very bubbly character, but also identified she was not afraid to come over and support someone with kind words when they were having a difficult time. To accommodate her fitness lifestyle, she decided to do a course around it at Kent University. Her semester started on the 28th of September 2015 and it was a chance for a new lease of life for Molly as although the university was only a matter of miles away from her house there was the opportunity to meet new people from all over the country. Once again due to her magnetic personality Molly did not find it difficult to make friends. Molly threw herself into university lifestyle of working hard and partying during freshers week. The term fresher is used to describe people who are in their first year at university. A number of universities and surrounding towns put on events for freshers week which are designed for ways for people to get to know each other. But Freshers Week often turns into a month of debauchery. Molly managed to hit the ground running with relation to the workload, however, and by the end of the first year, she was a straight A student. Molly was an extremely goal oriented individual, but although she was 22 at the time, did not have a lot of experience on the dating scene. Her mother, Joanne, stated that she had only had a couple of boyfriends in the past and no relationship had lasted longer than six months as she simply did not have the patience. As the second year of university was drawing nearer, Molly decided that she was going to join Tinder. Now confession time here. I have never used Tinder, but I have had some friends who have. So for people like me, who have only heard the name and not 100% sure how it works or what it is, here we go. Tinder is an online dating app which was launched on the 12th of September 2012 that matches couples based on their physical attraction to one another. It automatically alerts you to other Tinder users who fall within a specific age range and gender and are within a certain distance of your location. The user then decides whether or not they like the look of the person. If you do, great. If you don't, they'll never know. Below the picture is a heart icon and a cross. Tap the heart if you like them and cross if you don't. Or you may have heard the expression, swipe to the right if you like them swipe to the left if you don't. If you are both interested, then Tinder's messaging function offers you a private chat in which to talk and get to know each other a bit better. There's no 250 question registration process like other dating apps, as while personalities are ultimately what's important in the long-term relationship, Tinder recognises that when developing an attraction, establishing how well suited you are to a person often comes second to the way that they look. Joshua Stimpson and Molly matched on Tinder in July 2016. Joshua Stimpson was a 24 year old double glazing salesman. They chatted on the app and ended up messaging each other regularly before they eventually met up for the first time in November. Before she met up with him, Molly told her mum she was nervous about seeing him for the first time, but after they met and he seemed normal, she eventually relaxed. Stimpson told Molly that he also had a history of mental health issues, 
and Molly felt comfortable discussing the previous issues that she had had. He was open about his bipolar disorder, although it had never been formally diagnosed. After first meeting Stimson in November, Molly's mum said the two visited each other frequently. Before meeting Stimson, Joanne McLaren had said if Molly liked him, she and her husband would also. Molly introduced him to her parents the same month. With Molly's mum describing her apprehension when she was told that Stimson was bipolar, but she described him as normal every time that she had met him and said she never witnessed any sudden change in his mood. Joanne McLaren explained that Molly experienced Simpson's immaturity for the first time when he left his job just after they became a couple. However, the two continued to see each other regularly. Molly arranged to introduce Josh Stimson to her friend Amelia at the gym after they had been dating for just over four months. Although Molly had informed her friends about how great their relationship was, Stimson did not make a great impression on her friends. Amelia, in particular, in a documentary, reported that Stimson was very abrupt with them and Molly had confided in her that Stimson had shown a mutual dislike, planting the seeds of an intervention in the girl's friendship. It was then Stimson started showing his true personality with Molly. Despite Molly introducing Stimson to all of her friends, he had never reciprocated and she had never met any of his friends. Stimson would want to spend every hour of every day with Molly, which sometimes is a nice thing to say to someone, but when this actually is a reality, it causes a feeling of smothering. Molly was an independent female, enjoying time with her friends, and Stimson started to come between them, often causing issues for Molly when she was scheduled to go out. When Molly would address this with Stimson, he would become very argumentative. In March 2017, she told her mum she was bored and was thinking about breaking up with him. But after a while apart and constant messages from Stimson begging and saying that he would change, Molly got back together with Stimson against the advice of a few of her friends who still did not trust him. One of their first big arguments happened when she had caught him recording and videoing her so he had things to use against her. In April 2017, Joanne McLaren described the first time meeting Stimson's family after they had travelled to London to support him running the London Marathon with his brother. Stimson's parents had commented on the good influence that Molly had on Josh, adding that she had pushed him to look towards his future. Stimson and Molly were staying in their own room at the same hotel as Molly's parents when the argument broke out. Joanne recalled how Molly had called her to their room after they were arguing. Earlier in the evening, Stimson had deliberately walked ahead of the family and not being with them, completely ignoring them and generally being an arsehole towards Molly's parents. When Joanne arrived in their room, she found Molly pacing up and down angrily before the 23-year-old said, You won't believe what he has done. He's been recording me and videoing me. Joanne described how Molly had told her that Stimson had simply laid on the bed and acted as cool as a cucumber during the argument. Joanne had commented that his behaviour became more possessive after that. Quote, He just would not let her put him off. He would just turn up even if she said no. 
Her friends would report that Molly would make plans with them to go out to gigs or nights out. Stimson would always interject himself into their plans, whether she invited him or not. The pair's relationship became strained and Molly told her friends that she faced a dilemma as she found herself no longer attracted to Stimson. Before calling it a day, however, she decided to see if things would improve after a holiday for the two of them in Tenerife. On that holiday, Molly sent concerning text messages to her friends about Stimson's loutish behaviour. One text sent to Amy Lee read, This is the worst thing ever. The most concerning thing for her friends was that she would always have to abruptly end the conversation by saying the words along the lines of, I can't talk now. After returning from the holiday in May 2017, Molly had told her mother she definitely had no feelings for Stimson anymore and was going to end their relationship. She ended up doing this on the 17th of June 2017 in a pub in Maidstone, Kent. When Stimson had turned up to the late birthday celebration for Molly, which she had wanted to be exclusively for her female friends, she took him to one side and ended the relationship. Stimson did not take the breakup very well, storming out of the pub shouting at everybody, I can't believe she just broke up with me, along with a number of other explicit filled rants. Molly thought that the nightmare was over and went on to enjoy the rest of her night as best she could, unsuspecting that the nightmare was only just beginning. During a day out shopping with her mum on the 18th of June, Molly received a phone call from her cousin saying how Stimson had been posting horrible things to Molly's Facebook. This involved false allegations that she had dabbled with cocaine as well as pictures of her. All of these posts he had made sure to tag her family in so that they could see them. Joanne McLaren described how upset her daughter was with the posts, adding she was scared that the family members would see them and take the false comments about cocaine seriously. She was also concerned that as she now had a good reputation as a fitness blogger, it was obvious that Stimson was trying everything he could to destroy her life. A scared Molly texted a university friend saying, he's literally lost the plot. I'm worried he's going to turn up at my house, she said. I'm actually scared of what he might do to me. He knows my parents are going away for two weeks. After being advised by a family friend, Molly took the decision to collate the printouts of all the posts and go to North Kent Police Station in Gravesend with her mum, where she reported the abuse to PC Philpot on June the 22nd. During her time at the police station, PC Philpot dialed Stimson and put him on loudspeaker. He told him, we wouldn't want Molly to come to the police station again about you, would we? Stimson replied, wouldn't we? One particular comment Stimson posted, Joanne McLaren described as alarming, which had simply warned Molly that there was more to come. Upon leaving the police station, Molly blocked Stimson from all social media platforms so that he could not see her pages. On the night of the 27th of June, PC Philpot called Molly again and told her that Stimson had agreed to take down all the posts and all the comments. Stimson had apparently justified his actions by saying he did not want his clients at his new job to think badly about him. Joanne McLaren questioned this as odd due to the short amount of time that he had been with his new job and the fact that he did not have any clients, 
and they would not be on his Facebook page. He had recently started work at another double glazing firm. In the days following the breakup, Stimson registered at the same gym as Molly and regularly turned up at the same places that she was. Molly had visited Pure Gym at the Dockside Retail Park in Chatham on the morning of June 28th as she had to film herself exercising as part of a course to become a personal instructor. She preferred to do her own classes rather than join in a class. That evening, she visited the Ship and Trades pub with a group of friends to celebrate one of them getting a new job and Molly being accepted onto the personal training course. As the group were in the midst of enjoying their evening, Stimson is said to have entered the pub with another girl who the group did not recognise. Her friend, Chloe Stone, described how Molly did not seem scared by Stimson's sudden appearance, describing the reaction amongst the group as being, what a creep. Molly apparently told her friends that the lack of reaction that she had for this appearance proved to her that she had moved on. At first, there was puzzlement as to how he had worked out where Molly was that night, but the group soon realised it had been posted on social media earlier that day. Despite the fact that Molly had blocked Stimson from social media, he had used a female friend to stalk Molly's social media accounts, finding a post which had indirectly told him where she would be. During the evening, Stimson had walked right past the group's table towards the smoking area, despite the fact that he didn't smoke. As Molly went to leave, as she wanted to be home in time to watch Love Island, she told her friends that she wanted to tell her mum that Stimson had showed up at the pub that night. Her friends told her, don't worry about that psycho. As she went to the bar to pay, Stimson tried to acknowledge her with a smile, but she chose to ignore him. On the 29th of June 2017, Molly went to Pure Gym at the Dockside Outlet Centre and started working out. She was seen by a staff member entering the gym at 10.10am. At 10.25, Stimson arrived and entered the same workout studio as Molly, placing his mat right next to hers. CCTV shows him pacing up and down the stairs before going into the studio. If you watch it, it almost looks as if his conscience is going to get the better of him, but alas, it did not. When Molly saw Stimson, she immediately texted her friend Amy, who advised her to remove herself from the situation. She agreed. Before leaving, she decided she had to confront him. Molly asked Stimson, What are you doing here? I thought you should be at work. Are you following me now? To which Stimson replied, That is none of your business. Stimson then abruptly picked up his stuff and left. Taken aback, she then proceeded to text her mother at 10.45am to say, Mum, he's turned up at the gym and come next to me. She then telephoned her mother, who advised her to come home straight away but drive safely. Molly gathered her things together and left the gym. As she walked across the car park, Molly sent a WhatsApp message to her friends at 11.02am, which simply read, Feels like I'm fucking looking over my shoulder all the time. Amy Lee replied to Molly, Don't worry about him, he's a psycho. Little did Molly know that Stimson had been driving around the car park waiting for her to leave. She had opened Amy's message and prepared herself for the journey home. 
at 11.08 a.m., having spotted her going back to her car, Stimson saw his opportunity to make a move. Cody Jarvis, who was a witness, said, I had parked my car. I saw Stimson drive up in his vehicle. He got out of his car. He walked quickly towards Molly McLaren, who was sitting in the driver's seat of her car. Stimson yanked open the driver's side door of Molly's car before launching his frenzied assault. Inside the vehicle, Stimson attacked Molly with a paring knife which he had brought with him. Molly started screaming. Benjamin Morton, who was another witness who had tried to intervene, described Stimson as continuously stabbing Molly in the neck and the head, adding, it was like a frenzy, he was doing it again and again. Brave Mr Morton courageously attempted to halt the attack, slamming Stimson's leg in Molly's car door, pulling at him, then parking his car in front of Stimson's to block his escape. Stimson eventually climbed out of the car, covered in blood, and was seen to wipe the blood from his face. Stimson paced up and down the length of the car and then stood next to it. When officers arrived minutes later, he walked towards the police car and said, You want me? before being arrested. Joshua Stimson had stabbed Molly McLaren 75 times, which was revealed at the post-mortem. Despite the efforts of the paramedics, Molly McLaren was officially declared dead at 11.43am. When the police interviewed Stimson, he chose to reply to all of the questions with no comment. Joanne McLaren, in her own words, she describes the last communication with her daughter and the reaction after hearing from a friend about the aftermath. She said, Mummy's just turned up. So I said, what, the gym? So she said, yeah. So I said, oh. How did, how, how did he know you were there? She said, I just don't know. I said, where are you now? She was by the lockers or something. I said, just, just come home. Which I wish I hadn't now. Because if she'd stayed there, maybe. With people around her. She'd still be here, but I said, come home. And that was the last time we spoke. She just sent me a screenshot of an incident that had happened at Chatham Dock site and I just knew instantly. And I tried to contact Molly again and it just, there was no answer. They wouldn't say anything in the shop. They said they needed to bring me home. And they got me into the police car and I just kicked off in the police car because I just knew. And then we got in and before we even sat down, I said, you just got to tell me. And they just said, yes, it's modern. I said, she's dead, isn't she? They said, yes. <laughs> On the 30th of June, 2017, Joshua Stimson was officially charged with the murder of Molly McLaren. I'm just going to allow everybody a couple of seconds just to reflect on what's just happened. So what is known about Joshua Stimson? Stimson grew up in Stoke-on-Trent, but had moved to Medway in Kent with his father after finishing secondary school. His mother still lived in Staffordshire and he used to visit regularly. The behaviour that he had shown with Molly was not unique. 
Just months before meeting her, Stimson had stalked two other girls. The first was Alex Dale, who he had met in Newcastle under Lyme, a town approximately two and a half miles from where his mother lived, and he had met her through Tinder. After having met at a local pub, the pair had gone into Revolution Bar where Stimson had told her not to talk to any men because he did not like it. When the night was over, Alex received around 25 missed calls from Stimson. She described how he would send her pictures of herself asking why she was wearing certain clothes, but said she was not with him when he had taken the pictures. The abuse culminated in Stimson sending a message to Alex while she was on holiday, saying, I'm going to fly out and drown you. He also told her ex-boyfriend she had slept with his brother, sent her a picture of her back garden, despite her never having told him where she lived, and slashed all of her tyres after telling her there's a surprise waiting for you when you get home. Alex Dale had also been to the police about Joshua Stimson. A few weeks afterwards, he'd become obsessed with another girl, Leah Hubbard. Leah told a similar tale of how the two had begun dating, only for Stimson to grow increasingly controlling when she was not always available to spend time with him. Leah described her brief relationship with Stimson after they met at the Source Bar in Maidstone in May 2016. After meeting several times the week after their first encounter, Leah told him that she had to go on a hen do on the Friday. After Stimson reacted badly, when she also had to go and visit her nan for her birthday that Sunday, he began repeatedly attempting to call her and text her via WhatsApp. Leah said she ended the relationship a week later, but described how he had come to her flat at 2am when she had been asleep. Stimson used the story that he had been abandoned by his own friends in town and needed to charge his phone. She described how she had stayed up with him and asked him to leave when his phone was charged, but allowed him to stay when he burst into tears. The following day, she warned him that if he ever came back to her flat, she would call the police. On a later night out at the source bar, she described how Stimson always seemed to be in the same room and was always watching her. On another occasion at the venue, he spat a drink at her. Then, after being thrown out, he waited outside for her for hours. Even his workplace was noticing the change in him. When referring to the holiday to Tenerife, which Stimson and Molly went on prior to the breakup, Trade manager Eleanor Child told police the bright Josh from before the holiday was not there. There were two completely different sides to Josh. After his holiday, he was vacant, couldn't engage in conversation, and when distressed, would cry for no reason. Stimson's work attendance was sporadic up until it was agreed that he should work part-time. His first day off under his new shift pattern was Thursday the 29th of June 2017, the day of the murder. Molly's funeral took place on Monday the 21st of August 2017 and in accordance with her parents' wishes, Gravesend Crematorium was a sea of colour as hundreds flocked to remember her life. And so, for a couple of hours that morning at least, 
The crematorium, which overlooks the river, became a kaleidoscope of colour beneath the gloomy, overcast skies. Molly's friends and family members were encouraged to bring a photo of her, as well as a flower from their garden. More than 200 people waited either side of the short, winding road leading up to the crematorium entrance, where the hearse carrying Molly's body arrived at 11am. The coffin was covered in flowers and a replica Arsenal shirt, similar to the ones worn by many of her loved ones throughout the service. A piper played Flower of Scotland as she entered the chapel. Her father, Doug McLaren, said, I was born in Scotland and Molly was our flower of Scotland. She always wanted me to take her to see the highlands and the locks. Such was the turnout. Both chapels were opened up, with the service being broadcast on screens in the crematorium waiting area, as well so that everybody could watch and listen to the tributes from families, friends and colleagues. Friends were told how Molly achieved an extremely rare mark of 99% in one of her exams. They were also told she was someone who was determined to make a difference to people's lives and invariably she did. Memories were recalled tears shed and laughs shared during a slideshow of photographs documenting Molly's growth from small toddler to popular adult set to a track fittingly titled Molly Smiles. The service concluded with S Club 7's song Reach as mourners exited the chapel, laid their flowers and added cash donations to the Molly McLaren Foundation set up in her honour, which, at the start of the day, had already raised more than £14,000. Friends and family then made their way to the Leather Bottle pub where she once worked in our home village. Doug added, All of the family were humbled by the numbers that attended and by the love and affection shown by all. We never realised how many friends Molly had. They all had such lovely things to say about Molly. It was so touching. On January 23rd, 2018, Josh Stimson stood trial at Maidstone Crown Court. He pled guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility, but denied murdering Molly. Judge Adele Williams officiated Stimson's trial, with Philip Bennett's QC representing the Crown Prosecution Service and Oliver Saxby acting for the defence. Mr Bennett's QC addressed the court. There is no dispute that the defendant killed Molly McLaren. In certain circumstances, the charge of murder can be reduced to manslaughter. In this case, the defence will assert that is what it should be. The defendant has pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Molly McLaren. The plea is on the basis that at the time of the killing, Joshua Stimson was suffering from diminished responsibility. The prosecution does not accept that he was. Stimson argued that his mother leaving the family when he was a teenager had left him with a pathological fear of abandonment. In the years that followed, he was repeatedly referred to a mental health clinic in Gillingham and had a hypersensitivity to any rejection. However, Psychologist Dr Philip Joseph 
said Stimpson did not have a personality disorder but had narcissistic traits and showed no remorse for killing Molly. The problem with his claim for diminished responsibility as the court heard was that his actions were clearly planned. He pursued her constantly. He went shopping for the weapons he used to kill her before the attack. Jurors were shown a CCTV image of Stimpson in an Asda store in Chatham buying a Sabatier paring knife at around 5pm on the 27th of June. About half an hour later, he bought a Saxon pickaxe from home base further along the same road. The knife was the one that was used to kill her two days later, Mr Bennett said. Stimpson was dressed in a blue suit, blue shirt and tie and was flanked by four dock officers and medical staff. Stimpson cried and dabbed his eyes with a tissue as he entered the courtroom and listened to the details of the case. The court was told by Prosecutor Philip Bennett's QC that it was clear he had a problem with women describing his aggressive behaviour after breakups. In his summing up at the trial, Mr Bennett's made many references to the cold, calculated nature of the killing, also drawing attention to Stimpson's behaviour with the previous partners, as well as his apparent planning which went into the attack when he purchased the weapons days before Molly's death. Mr Bennett relied heavily on the evidence given by psychiatrist Dr Joseph, who had been called by the prosecution, who said there was not enough evidence to suggest that Stimpson was suffering from personality disorder. In his closing statement, Oliver Saxby, defending Stimpson, took the time to try and deconstruct much of Dr Joseph's evidence, highlighting the differing opinions of Dr Joseph and the psychiatrist called by the defence, Dr Majid. He emphasised how Dr Majid had been the lead forensic consultant at the psychiatric unit Stimpson had been referred to following his arrest and insisted that he hadn't been called as some kind of hired gun to come in and bamboozle you all. Mr Saxby suggested that Stimpson suffered a massive loss of self-control on the day of the attack and said that aspects of his behaviour could be seen as impulsive, a sign of a personality disorder. He also highlighted how his controlling behaviour towards women was another indicator of a disorder. However, this was not enough to convince the jury. On the 6th of February 2018, they unanimously rejected his plea of diminished responsibility and took less than three hours to find him guilty of the murder. Addressing Stimpson, Judge Adele Williams said, She told the court an aggravating feature was stalking and there was no mitigating factors before handing down a life sentence. Sentencing him to serve a minimum of 26 years in prison, Judge Adele Williams said, This was a cruel, calculated and cowardly act. The judge told Stimpson he may never be released for his wickedness. She added, you slit her throat while repeatedly stabbing her. You were determined to punish her for finishing it with you. You were seeking revenge. Stimpson stared blankly while the sentence was passed down, but smiled at his dad before he was led away. Molly's family released a statement thanking Kent Police and Benjamin Morton. Sergeant Ali Walton, 
gave a statement outside of court on behalf of the McLaren family. Good afternoon. I'd like to read a statement out on uh, behalf of the McLaren family. The last six months have been horrid beyond belief. We could not have got through it without the love and support of family and friends. The number of Molly's friends has staggered us, the like of which we have never known. Those that have visited and shared in our pain have been a great help. We would like to thank Kent Police for their diligence collecting and collating the evidence. We would also like to thank the prosecution team for expediting the due process of the law. The full extent of the digital stalking of Molly by Joshua Stimpson may never be known. We would like to thank Benjamin Morton for his brave efforts at the car park when he tried to intervene and hope one day to thank him personally. The contrast in morality between these two people could not be more profound. However, in light of this case, we feel that there needs to be more awareness over the dangers of stalking and the need for people to report any concerns over stalking to the police. The verdict has brought us a small measure of comfort, but it seems that nothing will take away the pain or allow us to come to terms with our Molly being taken from us. We are serving a lifetime of pain, anguish and loss. This has affected so many people's lives and our hearts go out to each and every one of you. Our focus now turns to making sure Molly will live on through the Molly McLaren Foundation, helping people with eating disorders. Thank you for all of your ongoing support with this. A light has gone out in our hearts, but shines bright as a star forever glowing. We love you, Molly. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will reread that last line to you again, as I think that it hits home the pain the family felt. A light has gone out in all of our hearts, but shines bright as a star forever glowing. We love you, Molly. Molly could not complete her final year at university. But on the 10th of July 2018, Joanne and Doug McLaren collected a posthumous diploma on her behalf at Rochester Cathedral. Her grades were with a distinction and, had she had the chance to finish her degree, in all likelihood it would have been a first class honours award. Upon receiving the diploma from the Dean, Molly's parents received a rapturous standing ovation from the congregation. Rather than me tell you about it, why don't you hear it for yourselves with the words from Jane Glue, who was the college master. Most Honourable Chancellor, it is with great sadness that I now invite Doug and Joanne McLaren to accept the award of undergraduate diploma in sports and exercise for health awarded posthumously to Molly McLaren. He gives them the certificate, speaks to them, and it's at that stage after that that everybody gets the nod. And at the same point, Gavin turned Joe and Doug towards the congregation um, so they could hear and see the celebration. In Molly's memory, her parents set up the Molly McLaren Foundation. The Molly McLaren Foundation is to raise awareness of eating disorders and to raise funding for charities who can provide direct support to sufferers of eating disorders. I have put a link in on the social media pages. In a quote taken from their website, our mission as a charity is to continue Molly's work and to help people facing the challenge of an eating disorder. The battle is not forlorn. It can be won. That was Molly's mantra and it is one we sincerely hope 
that everyone who has an eating disorder can take on board. The family of Molly McLaren marked what would have been her 24th birthday with a festival in her honour. Her father Doug said that the Molly Fest event will be celebrating her life and raising funds for the new charity in her name. The last time that a lot of these people would have been together would have been at the funeral, so hopefully this is going to be a happier day than that one, he told ITV News. We chose her birthday for a reason. We wanted to remember her and take her charity forward. Molly was quite open about her eating disorder and she found a lot of comfort in sharing her story, said her close friend Amy Lee. She really wanted to use her message to help other people. Molly's family used the sold out event in her hometown to give a boost to the charity work and also give a chance for those who loved her to gather and celebrate in her memory. Her father said, Molly was a keen party goer. She loved festivals, so that's half the reason we've done it. Wow, that was a really difficult one to write. I apologise that it was so long, but I wanted to ensure that I could bring the awareness out in that case, as well as the story of Molly. If the content of this episode has made you think about whether or not something that is currently happening in your life might be considered stalking, please listen to this message from the Susie Lamplew Trust about stalking. I would say that I apologise for keep going on about this, but even if I only help one person out of a situation they find themselves in, I'll be happy. Stalking. That's a big word. But what does stalking actually mean? It doesn't just mean a stranger ambushing you from the bushes or lurking through the window. It can also mean disturbing emails, non-stop phone calls, creepy letters and social media abuse. It means the other person ignores your no. It means you are forced to change your life routine for months or even years. Oh, and it's not flattering or funny. It's a serious crime. So, if you're being followed, if there are eyes on you wherever you go, If you are scared to open the door or your mailbox or your text messages, if you jump every time the phone rings, if you haven't had a good night's sleep for a very long time, then this is stalking. So I guess that's it for another week. I echo again that I love every single one of you for giving me the chance to do what I do and it's nice to know that I'm not sitting here talking to myself. Please remember, if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. Or look out for our Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast. That's True Crime Fix Podcast on Facebook. I'll be posting information about the week's case on there. I will also post things on Facebook in particular for a much more interactive experience. I plan on doing Q&A sessions soon, but not sure on what yet. Plus, I'll be posting videos of some of the areas in relation to some of the stories that I have told you so that you can get a greater feel for the area. Please, if you have any suggestions for the show, please contact me at True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. That's True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. I'm also asking, if you don't mind, giving me five minutes of your time to leave a review on your podcast directory. I don't like asking for that, but if you don't mind, it would be extremely appreciated. 
After this episode, I think this is the most poignant time I've ever said this. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest, because you never know who or what might be standing around the next corner. Take care, everyone.